It is 12.02. Welcome, everyone. We will be starting. My name is Jandia Zubrzycki. I'm professor of sociology, and I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And today I have the immense pleasure to host a, a very special panel um, with five of the seven uh, Ukrainian fellows uh, that we're hosting this year at the University of Michigan. Uh, as well as the rector of the Kiev Mohila uh, Academy, uh, Sergei Kfit. Um, I will introduce each speaker, but before I do this, I wanted to say a few words about the fellowship uh, itself, because I think that's a very important contribution from the University of Michigan, um, not to the war effort, but it is our modest contribution, yet important one, uh, for uh, Ukrainian scholars, Ukrainian Academy, um, and for the University of Michigan. Um, so as soon as uh, news uh, broke out of the Russian Federation's invasion of Ukraine on February uh, 24th, we got to work trying to really set something up for uh, Ukrainian scholars. And we, uh, thanks to the generosity of uh, private donors and partners at the University of Michigan. I will name them because this is very important. Um, so the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, the Department of History, the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies, the Copernicus Center for Polish Studies, the Ford School of Public Policy, as well as the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies contributed to uh, bring together to Ann, Ar to Ann Arbor seven Ukrainian fellows uh, and their families. And they have been here since mid-August and they will be here uh, until at least um, the end of uh, this next summer. And they are being matched with faculty mentors for whom we're also very grateful. Um, they work with these faculty men mentors and that, as we'll be talking about too, they're working with each other on, on research projects as well. Um, so I want to express again our gratitude to our partners for the creation of this fellowship, and we wanted to really have um, the scholars talk about their experience as scholars, scholars seeking refuge, that's the title, title of our panel, uh, but also talk about with uh, President Kvit um, the situation for universities and institutions of higher learning currently now in Ukraine, and what are the prospects for the several years to come um, in the process of reconstruction. Um, so we have several, I think we have over 50 people on Zoom. Uh, after we have our panel discussion, we will open to, to you in the audience, as well as to people on Zoom. I will read you, your question. And we want this panel to be really a discussion among panelists um, and with you in the audience. And now I will introduce um, our speakers. So we have Oksana Chabanyuk, who is Associate Professor of Architecture at Kharkiv National University of Civil Engineering and Architecture. And she's also, and now I realize that I forgot to mention, of course, the important contribution of the Taubin, Taubman School of Architecture, uh, where Oksana is affiliated is, and is teaching uh, this year. Uh, we have uh, next Yuri Kaparulin, who's associate professor in the Department of National and International Law and Law Enforcement at Kherson State University. He's also a specialist of um, Holocaust uh, history in Ukraine and a specialist of, on um, the, the issue of genocide. Um, Anata Ronenko, who is a senior lecturer of international relations at the National University of Kyiv Mohila Academy. Next, we have Ksenia Yurtayeva, who is associate professor of criminal law and criminology at Kharkiv National University of International Affairs. And Katerina Serunyuk Dolgar Dolgaryova, associate professor of journalism and vice dean of international affairs as, at Zaporizhzhia National University. We have also the privilege to have with us on screen next to our speakers, uh, Sergi Kfit, who's rector or president of National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, 
he served as Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine from 2014 to 2016, when the progressive laws on higher education and on science and research were adopted. Professor Kfit is the founder of the Akiv Mohila School of Journalism and became president of the Media Reform Center. His research focuses on educational media reforms, mass communications, and philosophical hermeneutics. So I will move to this chair to uh, moderate the conversation that we will have. And I would like to start with a general question to all members and then you know, feel free to jump in when you want to answer. Uh, but basically, I would like to hear what, how has the war impacted your research and teaching uh, at your personal universities? And how do you keep in touch with uh, your home institutions while you are here in Ann Arbor? I know that several of you are teaching. Uh, you wake up very early to, in order to, to teach to your students there. Um, it's very important to us to hear about basically what is going on there and how the war has um, impacted not only your private lives, but uh, your work. Who would like to start? So if I may. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> I am from Zaporizhia and uh, you all know, I guess, that this is like the frontline city right now. And uh, part of the oblast, the province uh, I live is temporarily occupied uh, by Russian forces right now, like about 60%. And that influenced greatly um, the university education itself in Ukraine and in my university particularly, because a lot of students are still um, at their homes, occupied homes. And that is a challenge uh, university had to, to face and uh, work with. Uh, many students, as everywhere in Ukraine, fled. Uh, they are displaced. Some of them are displaced within Ukraine. Some of them are refugees abroad. Uh, and uh, like multiple challenges the universities face. And uh, my university especially faces this problem, this challenge of uh, students who are under occupation. <clears throat> uh, universities work. Uh, many people are surprised how that's possible, but this is possible, this is happening, and we are very proud that this is happening. I guess my colleagues will confirm that this is uh, like the, the, the main um, sign that we are fighting, that we, are, we stand and we go, that we move, this is that we work. Uh, I teach, I still teach um, some courses uh, in my university, and uh, we were very fast in transforming our teaching style, teaching content. Um, of course, we are all uh, online. We are gone online totally 100%. And uh, because all the students are, as I said, replaced, displaced, or even if they are in Zaporizhia, a lot of uh, air rights um, sirens working every day, like several times a day. And that's... Um, of course, that has impact on how students, teachers work. So, um, of course, it's online. Uh, it's all based on our uh, computer systems, on our IT uh, people who are like, they are magic people. <laughs> they have magicians because we have, um, we have a system in place in my university where we can submit assignments, post our lectures, work through that system totally online with my students. And we use all the like video conferences technologies too, but I I will not talk much more. I want I know my my colleagues will add, but um, I think that the main message uh, from us is that we work and we will work no matter what. Electricity blackouts, you know, all this um, shelling every day, but we still work and we will. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add to this? Uh, I would also to add, uh, uh, so I'm uh, from Kharkiv uh, University of uh, Civil Engineering and Architecture. And uh, of course, the university stopped uh, uh, all the studies from the first day of the war. Uh, then the classes were re um, resumed uh, in April. We were trying to help students to be involved as much in their uh, studies as it could be possible. Um, 
I was uh, working with the bachelor diploma students and with master thesis, uh, master students uh, on their final uh, diploma projects uh, during, from, during that time until their defense. For instance, our university had all defenses online. Uh, we were in different places. Some of my diploma students were in the occupied territory in eastern part of Ukraine. And they had really very big challenges, even how to upload their final projects to the uh, Google Classrooms. That's the platform that we had been using. Um, and uh, we put all the efforts from all our uh, committee, because I was in the committee of uh, Master uh, Thesis Defense. Uh, and it, uh, uh, you know, we were in different cities. So some of the members were even trying to find the connection in the petrol stations because they didn't have the access to the internet. But we put all our efforts to help students to finish their studies. What I would say about the um, about my colleagues, uh, because uh, most of us uh, fled from Kharkiv as it was uh, horribly bombed from the first of of uh, March. And uh, um, some still are in Kharkiv. Uh, the research stopped, of course. Uh, uh, for instance, me, I received in the end of uh, January the place in the online uh, research laboratory in uh, Illinois University of uh, Urbana-Champagne. And uh, I wouldn't have, I, I didn't have any possibility to continue this um, uh, participation in the program. I asked to to postpone and to to, to stop uh, my participation. But uh, for instance, my colleagues, we are, which are still in Kharkiv, they are telling we cannot for concentrate on uh, writing papers because we are always in the uh, mood of with that we are waiting that something will happen. The explosion, the Red Sea ran, the, now the outrages of electricity. And so, so the situation is very difficult. But uh, now I'm continuing to uh, teach online as most of us. And uh, I'm happy that at least this helped uh, my small contribution to the higher education in Ukraine helps the universities, um, especially my university, to be um, positive in this sense. And the, the, the studies were not stopped now. If I may. Yes, of yeah. course. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm, my name is Yuri Kaparulin. I'm from Kherson State University. And uh, I would start from a couple of words to support and um, of support and solidarity with my colleagues who are now in Ukraine because we are scores in risk uh, right now in safe place. And thanks for the Wiser Center and the University of Michigan for this amazing opportunity. But uh, most of our colleagues right now are in Ukraine in, in many dangerous situations. Uh, and uh, I just uh, want to say thank you to all who, who stay in academia, who stay in profession in these difficult times. And uh, I would say a couple of words about specificity of Kherson, specific situation. Uh, probably you know, but I remind that uh, Kherson uh, is the city uh, what was surrounded by Russian troops, uh, troops from the first day of this war. And until uh, November 11, uh, it was uh, under occupation. And uh, it was not one day, one day when people can uh, left city safety. Uh, all people who uh, left city during these eight months, they they always uh, do it on own risk. And it, it really was always a risk for their lives. It, it's also uh, about my university and students because uh, students and uh, my colleagues, because, uh, because uh, so the, the first days, of course, the university stopped uh, educational process, but uh, very quick, uh, our uh, rector and our heads, they uh, decided to organize the evacuation of Kherson State University to uh, ivano Frankivsk to the western Ukraine, and uh, uh, Vasil Stefanik, uh, Prikarpatia National University, provide our university uh, great support, uh, share own uh, material base uh, for organizing our evacuation and staying 
um, during this month. And uh, also our university got a um, new uh, like official address because it, it was impossible to use our official address in Kherson under Russian occupation. So uh, many of my colleagues uh, moved to ivano frankivsk but uh, a lot of students and uh, colleagues uh, stay in Kherson during all this period of occupation because of many re reasons. Some of them have uh, elderly parents or, or, or can't uh, left people who, who need support. Uh, they do volunteering on, on, uh, in Kherson during this months of occupation. Yes, but uh, um, in conclude, we organized educational process. Uh, I, I would say we par partly we were prepared to this because of COVID pandemic. And uh, we, we had some uh, way to organize uh, our education process online by via Zoom. Zoom. Uh, and uh, also uh, last year's uh, uh, we created some uh, digital platform called uh, KSU Online, Kherson State University Online, uh, which uh, was uh, cr crucial, important for organizing um, distance uh, education process because in Zoom you always need to participate via stable internet or you know to, to stay in connection. But in condition under occupation, people didn't have uh, months and uh, weeks uh, internet stable internet connection but on this uh, KSU online platform uh, students can uh, can use the, um, uh, online sources when they uh, was connected yeah so download lecturers or, or uh, some materials um, for study uh, and uh, yeah so this is what what specific of education process in Kherson State University from the uh, first day of this war it's very briefly but maybe if you will have any questions uh, related to this i will be happy to try to answer thank you thank you and uh, so may i continue yeah. yes yes so i concur with what my colleagues uh, have uh, said that i believe um that uh ukraine and uh, ukrainian education system in terms of technologies have been uh, prepared for uh, this um force majeure for this uh, like um, extreme situation and um, on the uh, day of full-scale invasion the 24th of February uh, for instance we received a like notification email at once in the morning that's due to attacks um, uh, we will be uh, like receiving further information like until further notice about uh, uh, certain adjustments, which of course had to be done to the educational process, but we have been constantly in touch since the very like first, I guess like minutes, hours of the full scale invasion of uh, like we, we have been in touch with the administration of our uh, university and also with the and then we kept in touch with our students as well, and we are just yeah I'm amazed and personal I'm amazed by the courage and strength of my colleagues and my students, many of them are many of our students are either uh, currently abroad or on students like academic mobility, like in various countries worldwide, uh, like, in, uh, like in, in different parts of the world. Uh, some are like in, uh, in the um, European Union countries or North America, or some are in Japan. And men, men as well, or most? I would say probably um, mostly, uh, it's a bit difficult for me to say, but I guess mostly female, probably. Right. Yeah, I, I think so, yeah. And others are, of course, in Ukraine, and even last week, or uh, I guess when uh, the uh, like attacks on energy system, critical uh, infrastructure system were especially hard, I had students who still connected being like in bomb shelters in Lviv and still they managed to find some kind of way to use mobile internet and still to attend classes. Like I personally don't have such students, but I've heard stories from my colleagues who have students and some colleagues are also currently fighting like at the front line and still they managed to, um, to complete their uh, like academic tasks. And it's really just amazing. And um, I teach classes on actually international security, which is currently like a very urgent topic. And um, I see definitely that uh, um, interest from students. For instance, uh, this semester uh, they uh, are tasked 
uh, with uh, pro like producing a policy paper on the topic of international security of their interest. And many are interested in the uh, Russia-Ukraine war and different aspects, different dimension of this war. So definitely, yes, of course, there's urgency and there is um, uh, and there are students who uh, currently research uh, this like uh, uh, war, which is uh, ongoing. And the second class which I teach is on Hispanic studies and Spanish language. And, uh, and because we prepare future diplomats and we believe that Ukraine uh, needs to reach out to different parts of the world and to talk to different audiences and to present um, our country and our standing and our fight for democracy. So I'm very happy to uh, provide like a, a contribution to, to this process and research. Thank you. I just want to say that President Kvit, we're, we're not ignoring you. Uh, we, I'm bringing you into the con conversation as soon as I think Senya might want to say something. And then I, I really hope that you can provide uh, your unique perspective uh, as president of a university. But now, Ksenia, if you want to say something. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I'm a associate professor of Kharkiv National University of Antonio Affairs, and uh, what I uh, hear already from my colleagues that we have a lot of in common in our stories, but also I have something special to say about my university because we prepare cadets for the National Police of Ukraine, and of course the situation in our university is a little bit different because all our education right now is in person and all our cadets are right now in the Western Ukraine. But uh, talking about the first days, uh, due to the indiscriminate uh, attacks in Kharkiv, our university was evacuated from the first day of the aggression on the night of, after the uh, first day of the aggression, uh, to first to Kriminchuk, where we had our branch, and when the front line was moving, uh, our cadets uh, were moved uh, to their uh, Vinitsa and uh, uh, but it was uh, true for the cadets of the first year because the cadets, a lot of cadets of the second and the third year, uh, they were um, joined uh, our community policy and they were uh, joined uh, their uh, police forces. And uh, the, uh, in spring, they were uh, helping our police uh, to maintain law and order in our country. And our education moved in the online format. We, of course, had this experience with COVID times. So uh, we uh, basically... Uh, uh, post all their materials online, but at the same time, uh, we uh, try to be uh, not only like teachers to them, but uh, as mentors, because uh, in the time of the martial law, they needed some more guidance uh, on the legal and procedural issues, how to deal in specific situations. Uh, so, of course, it was also an important part of my job uh, in, um, in the, when we worked in the online format. Uh, our university pre uh, fairly quickly adjusted to the new situation and we resumed our work in there in person uh, in the summer uh, of 2002 uh, in this evacuated sites. Uh, Kharkiv uh, site was bombed three times. Uh, it was at least three major bombing and, and several facilities are right now ruined. Uh, and uh, all the education right now uh, is in, in person. That's why I'm not teaching, but I'm uh, working with my colleagues. We are making the changes to our curriculum due the, to the uh, introduction of the new uh, amendments to the criminal code of Ukraine. Mainly they uh, are concerned about the uh, crimes uh, against uh, national security. So uh, we elaborated new uh, textbook on this and it will be published very soon. And also we uh, are teaching more right now the crimes uh, which deal with the violation with uh, rules and customs of law. Because before we really didn't face these crimes, but right now our uh, police forces are facing them basically every day. They need to know how to uh, evaluate them under the uh, criminal law. They need to know how to uh, uh, gather the, all the necessary uh, evidence and uh, present this evidence uh, then uh, for, uh, further in court so they will be ready. And another thing that I would admit that our university, when uh, we worked in Kharkiv, uh, we had uh, the cybersecurity center. Uh, it was run by our cadets and we were uh, dealing with the issues, for example, of uh, uh, stopping the uh, drug, uh, drug bots uh, online or, for example, preventing online victimization uh, of the child or even uh, they were fighting some uh, fake news that were coming from Lugansk and Donetsk regions uh, starting from the 2014. And our uh, cyber center is right now resumed its work uh, in our evacuated sites and right now our cadets are working there as well. So this is also the scene that our uh, university is inputting in fighting the aggression right now. 
Thank you. I mean, that's very, very important work. And we'll get back to your own research about these issues, uh, about issues of also potential crimes against humanity and genocide um, and your research on that. But I would like to bring President Kvit uh, into the conversation, especially given your position, your expertise, your unique vantage point. We'd like to hear what, um, how you see not only your uh, university and the situation in Kyiv, um, but the situation, the overall collaboration between universities, uh, what you see as the main challenges now and in the months uh, to come, uh, and perhaps what you see as, you know, the process of reconstruction that will happen hopefully soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Professor Genevieve Zubritsky. And uh, I am so glad to join uh, our meeting uh, the second time during the month. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, we have a lot of different problems, but uh, first of all, we, uh, we are trying to continue our educational process and uh, uh, to keep uh, you know, enough level of quality. Um, so uh, in wartime, uh, you know, what we, what we are doing at Kim Hill Academy, we have, we call it hybrid and uh, decentralization approach. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, how we try to organize uh, our educational process. It means uh, the style of communication between uh, teachers and students depends uh, not only uh, on the decision of, uh, you know, of the university as an institution, but also it depends uh, on the position of our uh, faculties, uh, departments, uh, and uh, even personally our teachers. Uh, it depends on a field of, no a field of knowledge. Uh, for instance, uh, the most successful uh, maybe uh, our uh, law school, uh, I mean, uh, in gathering, uh, in participation of uh, their students, they have from time to time almost 100% of students uh, who uh, participate uh, in, in classes. They use, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, online video translation of uh, their classes and uh, all people who scattered, of course, uh, uh, not only in Ukraine, but but uh, in Western Europe and North America, uh, they try to participate uh, it uh, simultaneously. Uh, and uh, the same uh, similar situation with our uh, you know faculty of natural sciences. Uh, um, but it depends uh, how they can uh, organize uh, you know this work in the better way. Uh, and even uh, it's important uh, initiatives uh, from our teachers and, and students. We have a lot of, uh, for instance, initiatives uh, from students, for instance, how we can organize the better way uh, examination session uh, before uh, the end of uh, this year. Uh, it means encouraging of initiatives also, it's a very important part of our activity. Uh, we try to uh, develop our international collaboration uh, in different, different ways. Uh, we keep uh, uh, communication with our teachers and students who are currently abroad, with our international partners, with our, um, you know, with our uh, international campuses. I, I told you uh, in our previous meeting about, about this project. I mean, uh, we think, we as a community think that it's uh, you know, the most important is, uh, um, you know, the most important uh, in organization of our work under such circumstances is our attitude and uh, our internal, uh, you know, culture of Key Mahil Academy. Uh, and that is why, uh, you know, uh, my view is quite optimistic uh, how we are working currently. Uh, we have uh, the most, you know, uh, the most harmful problem problems are uh, uh, problem with light, with heating, and with access to the internet. But more or less, uh, using generators of power, uh, using uh, you know cloud technologies, uh, we 
we are overcoming all such obstacles. Uh, the second, the second question is, uh, what should we do after the war? And uh, to my mind, we uh, we need to uh, fulfill uh, our reforms, not only in a high education sector, but uh, you know all the most important reforms uh, uh, concerning high education system. First of all, it's uh, financial autonomy. Uh, you know, implementation of the concept of financial autonomy. It's it's really, really the most important thing. Um, the second point, maybe it's uh, integration uh, of Ukrainian higher education and research, because maybe I, I mentioned this problem. It was divided by Soviets in the middle of 1920s. Um, um, it's not only about continuation of educational reforms, but reformation of uh, justice system, anti-corruption uh, uh, system in Ukraine, uh, you know, uh, continuation of reform of uh, which we call new Ukrainian school, uh, which is based on uh, the most successful reform of decentralization. Uh, you know, it's very important uh, today uh, to, uh, you know, to, um, to, um, develop our universities uh, to 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 to, uh, to become our universities uh, you know uh, to do them uh, uh, you know usefulness uh, for uh, for local communities territorial communities you know uh, for local governments a collaboration between universities and, and local governments it's a really uh, important approach too uh, and the uh, brain drain, uh, brain drain, you know, uh, will depend on successfulness of, of our reforms because uh, for uh, especially for young people, it's important to to know that uh, they are needed for the country, for the society. Uh, we need to, uh, to create new opportunities for their uh, career development, uh, you know, that uh, we need to change the Ukrainian society. I mean, uh, we, we, uh, we try to look at the future Ukrainian society after the war as, uh, you know, we, we try to look uh, at the war as a, uh, maybe it's a sound, uh, it could sound strange, but it's kind of opportunity to change the society and to develop our country you know and uh, um, and uh, the point is that educational system uh, should play important role in all our reforms uh, and uh, I believe that we uh, will convince uh, our government uh, um, in this way, and uh, we will convince it uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, that that uh, our universities uh, should join to efforts of the government, because usually in post-Soviet world, uh, you know, it works, uh, you know, uh, in different ways, and uh, uh, the government usually uh, didn't uh, consider universities and educational uh, system as a whole. Uh, from the point of the development of the country. Uh, and that is why I think uh, we will do it and we will, uh, we will support our government and we will join our efforts. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, even in our hard uh, situation, uh, in time of the war, we try to uh, continue our reforms we, we try to be active participant, uh, you know, uh, participant uh, in uh, the case, uh, you know, in the effort of a reform in, in case of reformation, in the task of reformation of our country, and uh, to be participant even in in struggle for for independence. How we can do this from from the point of activity, uh, point of university activity. Uh, and uh, I would like to 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 maybe to to stop uh, my uh, short speech, and uh, I would be glad to to answer your questions if you if you have it. Thank you.
Thank you so much for joining us. And I, I want to point out that uh, President Kfit is in Brussels, I think, right now, joining us. Uh, he yes, was... I'm, I'm, I'm in Brussels for two days as a member of Ukrainian delegation, uh, delegation of Ukrainian academia. Yeah, and we, uh, we, we had today the first very fruitful day, and we uh, will have the next day tomorrow yeah, of our work here. So th this is actually, I think that's relevant to our discussion to think of universities as also involved in diplomacy and in uh, building ties with the rest of the world in the war effort. Uh, I, I think that's very important, um, you know, the role of universities, academics, you are here also as ambassadors of Ukraine in Michigan and the scholars here participate in all sorts of events on campus in Ann Arbor, in the greater Michigan, uh, Detroit area. So um, I think that's very important to think of universities, not just as institution of higher learning, but as really as, as institutions, national institutions and institutions that build civil society. Um, and what President Kfit also said just a moment ago about uh, the involvement of universities in reforming Ukrainian society as a whole uh, is also very, very important that we need to keep this in mind. Um, so perhaps we can switch and discuss your own research because you each have like very uh, important expertise and many of you, your expertise actually um, is relevant in either understanding or fighting the war. Um, and your, in, your expertise helped you switch, um, shift gears in a way. So for example, well, I'm just gonna say a few words and then you'll jump in, but um, Oksana is an architect, professor of architecture. And um, so this issue of, of the destruction of Ukraine's material er heritage is an obvious one. Yuri is an expert also on the Holocaust. Um, so how does the war impact now research on the Holocaust? A very important issue in Ukraine, but also thinking about genocide and what is going on now. Uh, we have experts here on cyber aggression, on cyber criminality, but also on fake news, social media, et cetera. So I would want them to talk a little bit about um, their research and how you have pivoted and made your research relevant to the current situation and beyond. So who wants to go first? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for this introduction uh, again. Uh, so my uh, expertise uh, uh, is in uh, prefabricated housing uh, that uh, also influenced uh, that um, I had been working a lot on it until the backgrounds of industrialization, early industrialization time in the USSR, especially in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and thus, uh, the, my current research that I am doing here at the University of Michigan that is connected with the uh, contribution of um, foreign uh, engineers and architects, especially Albert Kahn, which uh, was designing the industrial plants for the so early industrialization time in the Soviet Union. Uh, and in Kharkiv as well, uh, his uh, engineers had been working uh, uh, as the head of construction on the construction side, at the heads of the construction side of the Kharkiv Chapter Plan. And with uh, all my uh, uh, research materials, uh, which I uh, uh, am working on in Bentley Historical Library, which I started in uh, my Fulbright with, uh, previous time at the university uh, in 2019, 2020, uh, I uh, use for my uh, uh, teaching uh, at home uh, university and also here as uh, Professor Genevieve uh, Zabrzewski mentioned that I'll be teaching at the college, uh, Tauman College of Architecture and uh, uh, Urban Planning uh, in winter semester. I will have two courses and of course I will be uh, using and introducing all of the um, outcomes of my research, uh, not only in prefabricated housing, but about this topic that connects as well and uh, Detroit um, and uh, uh, in a more broad perspective uh, the course will be one of the courses will be 
uh, about the architecture of uh, Soviet Ukraine, uh, so with the focus of um, Soviet period, and uh, one more course uh, um, on uh, uh, urban concepts in Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, but at the same time, uh, now, uh, when the war started, uh, I, I would uh, talk a bit, tell a bit uh, about how does it influence on my views and my uh, approach to the research. Uh, so um, now I see, uh, and we also uh, can notice that, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, the biggest uh, uh, part of Soviet Union uh, that was the biggest part of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation, uh, is actually very dependent on the foreign technologies. And it, this is the parallel from the 30s, that uh, Soviet Union was dependent very much from the foreign technologies, which were brought uh, by uh, um, engineers uh, and uh, firms, uh, not only from the US, but also later from Germany uh, by architects. Um, and uh, um, that's the uh, kind of the wheel that's again that's on the on the, on the same point that uh, the technologies uh, uh, the the dependence of the technologies um, really forms the the um, situation and uh, now we hope that uh, the uh, all um, uh, stop of uh, supply of the technologies will also uh, prevent uh, all all this um, development but um, uh, as i mentioned my expertise in uh, prefabricated housing is, well uh, it's interesting that it was not so popular this expertise in prefabricated housing uh, from 1954 that started after the reform of uh, khrushchev uh, until the late uh, 80s uh, this topic was not popular in ukraine so, uh, and I received the questions when I was starting my PhD in uh, uh, 2001. Uh, why are you doing this? It's not interested at all, interesting at all. But I was uh, always concerned about the possibilities, uh, how to uh, make the living environment uh, with uh, more quality and how to change all those large scale uh, residential areas. At the same time, uh, uh, I was uh, doing the research in the European Union in different universities about the social housing. That's the system of social housing in Ukraine is absent uh, till now. But now we see uh, how the how many difficulties we have in Ukraine with housing, with inner displaced people, with the destroyments, with all the um, uh, damages, uh, uh, huge damages, and in Kharkiv especially, uh, of uh, housing, uh, um, and most of them are of prefabricated housing, and there will be still a lot of discussions what, how, and what kind of approaches we will have to take in order to, um, to, to rebuild. Yes, and uh, um, that's the uh, main uh, focus uh, or, um, in um, uh, the importance of my expertise in prefabricated housing now that uh, is uh, in the current situation. Thank you. Maybe I add uh, like in historical context because uh, it's also part of Aksana research here. Uh, I'm interested in topic uh, of uh, genocide history in Ukraine and mass uh, violence during Soviet times and uh yes uh I'm, I'm started like historian from the study of uh history of um uh, from intellectual biography of some uh soviet uh, military uh military and historian alexander Binyskarevsky, who were represented by soviet uh, government and uh, sent it to gulag where he died so um it was my start, but uh, my uh, current research is about uh, uh, Holocaust history in the southern Ukraine. So I'm studying one of the uh, hugest uh, examples of genocide in uh, world uh, history. And uh, but uh, um, on my focus, also another examples of mass violence, because I'm focusing on some uh, local communities, some local Jewish communities uh, who. Uh, lived in the southern part of Ukraine, and uh, I'm I'm focusing not only the Second World War years, but I'm also uh, trying to show the interwar period and life 
before World War II. And uh, I see that uh, these people who lived uh, in some Jewish settlements in the southern part of Ukraine, they also experienced uh, several types of mass violence uh, from uh, Soviet government. So they experienced uh, collectivization, uh, Holodomor, uh, Great Terror, and then Holocaust. And after the Second World War, also uh, anti-Semitic policy, um, which uh, which uh, under Stalinism, uh, late Stalinism, yeah. Uh, but uh, what important? So uh, uh, this year I offered my university a new course about uh, a history of genocide and crimes against humanity, and I was surprised that more than thirty students uh, uh, choose this course. Course and uh, on on the first uh, on the first uh, class, I asked them why why did you choose this, and uh, they told me uh, that uh, we are need uh, answers. It, it's students from different specialties. It's historians, lawyers, uh, uh, computer science, uh, and uh, many other specialties. And they told me some of them told me that we are need uh, we are need answers. We need to understand what's happening right now with us in Ukraine. Is it a unique situation? What's happening in Ukraine? Is this uh, aggressive war against Ukraine? Is it really genocide against against Ukraine nation right now? And I, I trying to show them that uh, we are not unique in this uh, world history, especially history of 20th century. And uh, in in the in our country, we have several types of mass violence. Uh, which uh, uh, mentioned like a genocide, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, Holodomor, uh, deportation of Crimean Tatar people in 1944, Holocaust. And, and uh, this year in April, our uh, parliament, Verkhovna Rada, uh, adopted a resolution uh, about that uh, the, uh, this war, uh, Russian war against Ukraine, it's also uh, genocide against, against Ukraine nation. So we can speak about several uh, precedence of genocide in Ukraine history uh, during one century, you know, and, and it, it, it's uh, it's it's huge uh, violence experience in our history. What we should rethink, and um, I, I believe it's it's very important to talk about this. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, Holocaust study can help us uh, to understand uh, current war. It's ups I mean, it's it's not. Uh, um, it's not a uh, uh, problem to uh, to compare this both uh, genocide, but maybe uh, when we will study uh, current war in in this uh, um, light in genocide studies, we also can uh, understand more what happened uh, in historical context during World War II. Yeah, so I have a, a quick follow up. <laughs> Uh, to this issue of, of research on the Holocaust, because some Holocaust scholars are concerned that the current war is, is so important and traumatic that it might uh, replace Holocaust memory in Ukraine and perhaps uh, temper or basically not silence, but that new research on the Holocaust in Ukraine, especially given that the, Russia is using uh, the rhetoric of Ukrainian Nazis, for example, could prevent further research on um, on the Holocaust in Ukraine. So, how do you see the relationship? Because um, it's it's important to think about the Holocaust and other mass violence against uh, members of the Ukrainian nation and beyond in Eastern Europe. Um, is there a risk? Is that do you think that there's something of that kind, or it's not founded? Uh, thank you. It's very interesting, and important question because uh, I I really asked uh, some same, pretty same questions several uh, times before our today's talk. And uh, what I should say is that uh, I, I I hope uh, that uh, this war it's will be uh, uh, it's help us more understand the Holocaust and and uh, studying the Holocaust. Uh, another way to help understand today's war, if we study genocide uh, field. But uh, uh, what what's important? We we should understand that um, we have several types of genocide violence, uh, and they are all important. We can't cancel any any uh, from focus. 
So uh, studying the today's uh, war and genocide in Ukraine, we always should understand and return to our past. And sometimes we can see connection, connection with today wars, uh, today war and Holodomor, and connection with uh, deportation of Crimean Tatar, because, because uh, uh, we know that Putin provides uh, policy based on uh, historical myths. And uh, he also used uh, this Soviet uh, vi vision of history to provide today's policy. And uh, the, one of the, his uh, uh, main lovely person in Soviet history, Stalin, who also commits mass violence in Ukraine and against Ukrainians. So uh, I believe, uh, uh, and what I see from uh, many of, uh, of my many my colleagues who study uh, Holocaust or other genocide, they uh, not only stop at study their own topics, they also join in to uh, to explain today's current war and show how how it's important to study all these uh, events uh, together all together. So I believe it, it will be not problem for us. But of course, um, my, my colleagues also say that we have some uh, very difficult uh, topics for discussion for today. Uh, for example, it's a problem of collaboration uh, because you know, uh, it was several um, uh, many well-known uh, examples when the Ukrainians collaborated during World War II and uh, commit genocide uh, Holocaust together with Nazis. And uh, today we also, uh, we, we can see that some Ukrainians participated uh, with the uh, uh, Russian administration uh, in uh, uh, temporary occupied territories. But uh, what's, what's very important uh, to see this phenomenon of, of uh, collaboration that, uh, that uh, this, uh, this personal crimes, it's not what you, you, you put uh, like and uh, say that it's committed by nation. It's, it should be judged personally. It should be judged personally. It's very important. So collaboration, it, 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 it's, and this is how we should uh, also see uh, the collaboration during Second World War. Uh, and Putin used this uh, idea that all Ukrainians fascists, this, that's why we are coming to Ukraine right now and try to liberate people uh, from, uh, from this fascist. No, Ukrainians are not fascists. Ukrainians were not fascists. Some people uh, were collaborators and uh, they were judged. Some of them, no. And today it's same situation. Ukrainians uh, not all collaborators. Ukrainians don't want it. Uh, Putin army uh, come to Ukraine, but some of them collaborated, and some of them should be um, should be punished for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I'm glad to continue this important topic. And in, in, actually, my uh, research is on disinformation. Is my interest is in um, international security, cybersecurity, and disinformation. And at the end of uh, 2021, the previous year, actually, it was uh, forecasted that uh, one of the like the most important trends to watch and to follow is the fight between democracy and autocracy, democracy and like authoritarianism. And actually, we see that the full scale invasion, um, Russian invasion in Ukraine uh, on the 24th of February actually is in line with this uh, prediction, with this forecast. We see how. Um, uh, democracy is um, is threatened currently, and if disinformation and spreading this uh, myths, spreading uh, like narratives of um, uh, with um, like malicious intent, is actually um, uh, uh, the purpose is to like undermine. In our case, is to undermine like Ukrainian statehood and to um, to spread this. Uh, um, idea of uh, like liberation, uh, like etc., and uh, that's why it's very important to study uh, the. Besides, we know and we see that um, it has been the case uh, like since uh, like a few years ago, several years ago at least. We see how at least maybe a decade, we see that information has become uh, it's often used and has been used as warfare, and we see that cyberspace is becoming a like um, like dimension of war just like war and uh just like uh land and air and uh and, and sea and it's very important um uh, to to study the trends uh to understand the phenomenon of disinformation and to um 
uh, elaborate techniques on how to counter this disinformation. Uh, and um, in, we see now that this is one of the major threats to, to democracy worldwide, and many countries have been the uh, um, victims of uh, false news and uh, spreading uh, like hate speech and um, like uh, uh, dangerous like rhetoric. And so I'm uh, currently researching the aspect of uh, Russian disinformation and Russian propaganda, uh, how it affects uh, like Ukrainian um, information security. And uh, also, of course, um, uh, uh, my plan is to provide recommendations and some steps on how to like, use uh, critical thinking uh, techniques and uh, like other steps in order to uh, efficiently um, like counteract and to counter this information. Yeah. So probably I will follow the discussion because it's probably good uh, for me to follow up to some legal topics and to topics of their misinformation because um, to take a little bit overview of my previous uh, studies, uh, I was I can actually divide uh, my studies uh, a little bit before uh, they were started and after because uh, but they're all interconnected because uh, from uh, 2014 actually uh, their area of my expertise like criminal law. I started to, uh, to uh, research in uh, some topics that uh, crimes that are starting to happen in our temporarily occupied territories, for example, terrorism, because we never faced such cases as terrorism. And then we had to face, qualify, and differentiate them from uh, such cases of sabotage, from violation of uh, rules and uh, customs of law. And uh, our law enforcement was not really prepared for this. And I was also uh, and, uh, studying some cases of mercenarism that were taking place in the temporarily occupied territories and their engagement of their uh, private military companies. So uh, the topics were coming with the commencement of the aggression on the territory of Ukraine. And we can really clearly right there see that it didn't start on uh, this year. It started uh, some years before this. And uh, I, for 10 years, I was uh, closely studying the issue of cybercrime. And when the war started, I really immersed myself into studying how cyberspace was used uh, by uh, the Russian Federation uh, like a military space in their military purposes. And it's really evident right now. And I took a broader perspective in my research. I was uh, starting uh, to understand, uh, to study this issue in their agenda of the uh, hybrid war. And uh, today, what we see, what the experts say, that uh, probably this conflict, uh, this war on Ukraine is uh, the first in history, uh, large scale cyber war or hybrid war. So, but the problem is that there is no such definition in international law as hybrid war or cyber war. We can, of course, uh, recall that there are some, uh, uh, some documents, for example, uh, uh, Tallinn manuals uh, on uh, application of international law uh, for in the warfare of cyber operations, but they are mainly their um, understanding of experts uh, how the law should be applied. They are not official documents. So, of course, uh, we can't, uh, they're even not official uh, understanding, of, uh, understanding of NATO nations, what is cyber war, even if they were, uh, in, uh, uh, they were uh, elaborated under NATO uh, auspices. Uh, that is why uh, in my research on cyber aggression right now, I study uh, how international law uh, can be applied to cyber conflict. And the thing is that uh, during, we can't uh, say that there is no like laws that we can't apply right now uh, for cyber conflict. For 20, uh, li uh, for 20 last years, we can see that uh, these norms, uh, norms are uh, basically crystallized from the body of international law uh, that uh, we can actually apply to their uh, cyber conflicts. And uh, most of the cyber experts, they actually agree that uh, uh, cyber uh, uh, space, uh, the international law and in, even international humanitarian law right now can be applied and should be applied in the cyberspace and especially in the time of the war conflict. But the questions that uh, I face and I try to resolve right now, uh, how uh, the uh, law will be applied before the uh, commencement of the actual war uh, conflict, and if uh, their cyber operation uh, can be equal uh, to their actual use of force and their uh, use of arms. And when we can do this, how evaluate all this. 
And this brings us back to the uh, concept itself of the hybrid war, which right now the main idea, which, which already we're talking about uh, uh, with Anna, that uh, it's a blurring of all the lines, it's blurring different tactics. It will be diplomacy, uh, even economics. It can be a blurring of all uh, everything in the same battle space, uh, battle space. And informational space right now is truly being used uh, as the same uh, space as uh, other uh, tangible uh, kinetic uh, fields. Another thing, what we can say about uh, hybrid in connection with cyber, that it's interconnection between uh, computer in between uh, kinetic and uh, analog, uh, analog and uh, digital uh, uh, dimensions. And in the same time, what, what I'm finding, what I'm trying to input in my research, that it's also uh, implication of psychological tactics that are used in the cyberspace. And right now they are widely engaged in their also like in the propaganda, informational coercion and informational influence uh, in uh, the Ukrainian war. Uh, so uh, in my research, I'm trying to concentrate on different tactics on different uh, methods of the attacks that being used. It could be a stricter uh, uh, cyber attacks, but which also would have uh, tangible uh, effects on their uh, mass uh, uh, West uh, uh, kinds of population. It can be influencing cyber, uh, cyber uh, uh, our infrastructure, it can influence even lives uh, of uh, different people. Uh, also, what is uh, different with uh, our conflict in Ukraine, that it combines uh, cyber and uh, kinetic warfare. And it's difficult, uh, very difficult to fight this, very difficult to evaluate this. But uh, of course, uh, for the kinetic uh, to cyber operations, we can apply international humanitarian law. This is understandable. And uh, another thing, of course, uh, this is... Uh, uh, cyber operations in the broader sense that we also uh, are talking about misinformation, cyber coercion, and how uh, to uh, build this cyber resilience. And uh, for me, I already, I feel that I'm coming out of my uh, expertise, like as a criminal, uh, uh, criminal legal studying, and I'm coming like to the further uh, fields, uh, and for example, like diplomacy, international law, and I'm very uh, was very uh, happy and very luckily I, uh, uh, I right now joined as a visiting scholar in their wiser diplomacy center and here I can also uh, uh, communicate and gain the expertise from the local ex uh, high uh, rank professionals who worked at their uh, national security uh, uh, departments, for example, of the United States. And uh, with their help, with the help of their expertise, it really improves my research and it really uh, uh, helps our country to build up its uh, cyber resilience. And uh, here I would probably would like to remember the words of our President Vladimir Zelensky that uh, he was saying that the end of the war will be shaped by the lawyers in the court. So I think it's a very important mission that is put on our of ourselves as a lawyers of our specialists uh, that uh, we should uh, actually uh, substantialize uh, this all this evidence and be able to present it in the national court and uh, we hope that we'll be able to present it in the International Criminal Ho uh, court, uh, court in Hague. Thank you. I will follow shortly. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yes, um, my, my expertise is journalism and mass media. And I'm really happy that I met Xenia and Anna here because uh, we can see, coincide in our research interest because uh, since the war started in 2014, um, I have been interested in media literacy, disinformation, fake news, debunking, all, all the information, world warfare, what happened uh, for these eight years. We need to be very clear on that, that it's an uh, ongoing process. Um, and I came here with the idea to research the narratives of Russian propaganda that are in media internationally and especially in American media. And I would uh, want to emphasize what Ksenia said, that we are really happy here in Visor, being Visor scholars, that we, that we have this network and connections with uh, very, very important journalists, scholars, um, like people in academia and abroad, and, um, uh, besides academia, uh, that uh, recently I had two seminars, two webinars with, um, University of Michigan Department of Communication and, uh, and Media uh, with journalism professor Anna Avila. Uh, we conducted seminars with journalists, uh, my, my department in the Bridger National University and uh, her students, American students. 
And that was really insightful and interesting for both Ukrainians and Americans, because of what from the questions that American students had, from their comments, I really understand that the importance of my research to show um, and to reveal uh, these um, like media messages, media content that American messages, um, like American media show in um, its audience, that people here also have questions about uh, narratives of Russian propaganda, how it's spread, uh, how, why it's uh, like, like, like general questions, really uh, sometimes simple questions, but we don't have simple answers. Uh, and uh, I was happy that my, my students, even being on all that uh, challenges that we talked about, they could communicate with American students. And we have this bridge of discussion and uh, you know communication between us. So, and I'm happy that we met like all the scholars here from Ukraine, I met, uh, and we are on the umbrella of Visor Center because uh, we can come up with multidimensional research, uh, multi truly multidisciplinary, especially on uh, like as Senya, as Senya said, it's like first cyber war. And we really need to show like evidence on that. And I know maybe you, Professor Genevieve, also said about reckoning project that is going on here. But I was truly uh, amazed, and I've heard about it, and know and follow now. It's that journalists are very important in uh, testimony, uh, collecting testimony of and um, evidence of the crimes, war crimes that uh, uh, that are happening in Ukraine, and uh, us journalists, media people like the crucial role of, of uh, journalists and media people now uh, collecting, you know, filming, recording um, all the information and following standards. So we are not blamed by anybody, especially Russians, yeah, that we are not uh, balanced, we are not, uh, you know, um, following the professional standards. So I really hope that um, we can do that all together. And that's why, like I see that uh, American academia, American universities, well, American people can help Ukrainians in that, providing resources, providing these opportunities to network, to uh, like to to show, to, like to uh, transmit the message of the importance of battle in this. All all what mentioned just today. Well, thank you so much. I mean, we're so happy that you're here. For us, it's a privilege also to be able to host you. So this is. Amazing. So Thank you. I'll say maybe a few words about the Reckoning Project if there's time at the end, but I want to leave um, perhaps President Feet, who's also an expert in media studies and journalism. Maybe you have something to add to what Katerina just said? Yeah. But first of all, um, I'd like to uh, say thank you very much for all uh these projects that you have, you are doing the great job. And uh, also to, to, to uh, say thank you so much to my uh, Ukrainian colleagues. It, it's really interesting uh, and I think and important, uh, especially in, in our current situation. Uh, uh, you know, that I, I think that we need to unite our, all our efforts, uh, especially in, uh, you know, uh, fighting of uh, Russian propaganda machine. To be honest, I think that uh, Russian propaganda was not so successful in Ukraine. Mostly, uh, mostly it was successful maybe in you know in the West. Um, and uh, uh, we have, I mean, uh, I I had today uh, some meetings with representatives of. Uh, you know, uh, uh, of uh, NATO headquarters, especially uh, with their analytics and analysis. And I think uh, that uh, they mostly agree that uh, the previous activity was not uh, focused on deep understanding of post-Soviet world and uh, especially Russia and, and Ukraine. And uh, they are changing their mind today uh, and, um, you know, it's a big process because I think we need to convince a lot of uh, representatives of, uh, you know, uh, Western intellectuals uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, think tanks 
that uh, we need to change a little bit our view on post-Soviet uh, post-Soviet uh, world. And uh, currently, it's the best chance, the best time for that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in Ukraine, uh, mostly we don't have uh, many problems with freedom of speech because we have uh, some uh, maybe, you know, uh, political problems, uh, some uh, hard discussions, but we really have freedom of speech. That is important. Um, and uh, from the point of uh, current media, from the point of mass communications, I think it's important to develop some new, not only narratives, but uh, some new concepts, how we can understand each other deeply, you know. And uh, for me, for instance, it's not clear enough uh, what about the term, uh, the understanding of Ukraine as a part of Eurasia, because, because it was not cancelled. Uh, you know, uh, it was a special concept that Ukraine is a part of Eurasia. And some more concepts. I think we need to, to change to change the view on the post-Soviet area conceptually with new concepts, with new ideas, with new discussions. And I believe that all these projects that were, um, you know, presented us today, uh, uh, you know, uh, to do something, uh, to make some contribution, you know, in, in, in this task. And I believe that we will do this and uh, we will uh, be successful finally. Um, it's our common tasks, I think, a common, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, um, it should be a big, uh, you know, common activity, how we can reconsider of our understanding, not only post-Soviet area, but our future world. Uh, so I, I think that we need to develop new concepts and new ideas and offer new ideas. And maybe your activity that, uh, uh, that was established at your university uh, after the full-scale uh, Russian invasion uh, was really, really important. And thank you so much uh, for that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think we will finish this portion of the event and open up to questions from the audience here and online. Uh, we have about half an hour if you're patient and you're able to remain. Um, I will start here in the room. You can raise your hand and I will, anyone? Yes, please, in the back. We'll bring a microphone. Thank you very much for your stories. Um, it was wonderful to hear. I was especially moved by your stories about your students. I'm not a professor, I'm not a student. How do you grade students? I mean, I would give everybody A plus for <laughs> just signing up for classes in these circumstances, but I'm not a professor. May I? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. It's really, really important because it's like human factor, we call it, yeah? We've been really flexible with um, collecting um, students' assignments and grading them because as my colleagues and I said, uh, many of them don't have any resources to, to, to study. And especially those who are on occupied territories, that's even threat to their life sometimes, uh, like to, to speak up, to, to provide like what they think. Uh, uh, or one of the students who are on occupied territories were on the webinars I mentioned, and she was telling us that uh, she has the frustration to speak what, what she thinks because all, all the Russian, uh, you know, civil, um, how you call it, like um, uh, control. Surveillance. Yeah, control of surveillance, yeah, of uh, the uh, internet. And uh, they also have like uh, problems with internet. It's been uh, very controlled, shut. All some of the Ukrainian uh, websites are not open at all. They are, don't have uh, access to media, Ukrainian media, uh, like all kinds of obstacles. But 
Um, I really uh, support Professor Squid's point that we try to keep as much as possible the quality of education. That's why we are flexible in deadlines. Uh, we give them assignments that they can write on, you know, write uh, with their hand and take a picture and send me via Telegram, for example, or Viber or any other social media. I have these tons of apps uploaded on my phone and each student can use it. Of course, like this is multiplies my load as a teacher to, you know, to look through everything. And, but this is our input in our victory. And I, uh, I really truly think that this is important for us to keep every single student um, on mind, uh, give attention to these people because they deserve it, because they truly want to get their education. And I'm not afraid of the brain drain mentioned today mm -hmm. because, uh, for example, the Parisian National University is in very dangerous place right now. So Parisian is one like, of the closest to front line. Uh, like less than 50 kilometers, we have Russian troops. But, and we were really afraid of um, problems with admission this year, but we were really happy that we have as many students and we had last year. They, they believe in us. They, um, they believe in Ukrainian education. They, uh, they are so under stressed everywhere in the world that they want uh, like to have this pillar of stability. Education is a pillar of stability right now in, in, for our people. So yes, answering your question, yes, it's hard. <laughs> it's very challenging, but it's possible. And we are doing that. All the teachers, as you said, they are heroes <laughs> right now. And uh, <clears throat> if I, if I may, yeah. Yes, and then I, I will start taking a cue. Uh, so if you can respond and then there's a gentleman there, then um, my colleague here, and then online, we're starting to get some. Yeah. So, so I'll be happy to just uh, to, to follow up uh, briefly. Yeah, so it is um, not easy, of course, and we are uh, trying to be as lenient as possible, definitely, because we, um, we understand that this is such a uh, challenging time for students and we don't want uh, like uh, additional pressure on them. At the same time, of course, uh, yeah, it's like a double edged situation. At the same time, we need to uh, um, uphold high academic standards, of course. Luckily, it's, uh, like my, I teach at Kiev Mahila uh, Academy and our students are exceptional. They are just uh, very like responsible. And uh, as I mentioned, yeah, they are uh, whenever Mm, it, it can happen. Like for instance, there's a seminar, and then a uh, student, oh, oops, uh, like there is uh, like uh, no like power outage, no electricity, and then students, uh, they are, but still they are able. We have like uh, like alternative channel, like we use Messenger, and they are able to text me and say, uh, okay, like I have no electricity, then can I please um, like get uh, like provide a paper, write a paper or do some other assignment to uh, to receive the points. And so they're very responsible and they follow up. And in terms of, so of course um, we try to, uh, it's, it's difficult to grade participation because uh, they all, like for instance, if it's discussion or we are, um, we're discussing some reading or like scientific articles, but if it's a written paper, for instance, or if it's a test and they make a mistake there, like, like about like technical points of grading, if they make a mistake in the, like a written paper, uh, then of course it's a mistake. And then like this like point or like half a point would be taken like from them because they had time to prepare. But of course we try to be as lenient as possible given the circumstances. And we are just amazed by, by, their, um, uh, by their dedication to the learning process. Thank you. Thank you. Please, if you don't mind saying your name. Uh, yes, my name is Roman Hrezio, I'm a professor up in the College of Engineering here. And thank you all for your um, wonderful presentations and sharing both your experiences and your personal lives and your research with us. Um, I have a maybe a little bit of a provocative question here. Um, I suspect that before the war, uh, specifically even before 2014, you may have had contacts with academics um, in Russia, in Moscow. And we all know in the conversation here was all about truth and our responsibility as academics, whether we're architects or criminologists or uh, economists towards the truth. And uh, my question is twofold. First, 
have you had any contact with academics from Russia today? And, uh, or say even Russian academics who are now in the diaspora? And what were the nature of those contacts and what is their responsibility to the truth today? I can, I can also like to take this question. So I, um, it just happened so that I personally have not had many contacts with the um, Russian colleagues uh, while uh, like researching, teaching in Ukraine. Like not really, it just happened so. But I can actually mention that when I came here to, uh, and I was lucky to get um, selected to be a uh, program advisor center for Europe and Eurasia at Michigan, uh, at the University of Michigan, and. Actually, here I met uh, some people, like researchers who I have known before and who are originally from Russia, and they are a part of Russian um, community here in uh, Ann Arbor. And uh, one of my colleagues, she teaches a uh, class on Russian uh, politics, and actually she invited me to speak uh, like as, uh, at her class uh, tomorrow, and uh, they are going to discuss the war um between Russia and Ukraine and so she is uh there's no problem at all because she understands uh the situation and she being of Russian like background um or like Russian citizen she still understands the uh, all the crimes of the current regime in, in Russia and uh, she like uh, it's hard to uh to um to support this kind of action and foreign policy, like domestic policy. And so, uh, yeah, so that there's an example of like academic collaboration. She, so she invited me to, to speak uh, uh, at her class and I'm happy to do so. And I may, if I may, I'd like to jump in because that's an important question about what is our role in maintaining also dialogue with uh, Russian academics and institutions and when, uh, the full-scale invasion started, we were also wondering, um, so should we invite uh, Russian dissidents, etc. So the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia decided that our prime responsibility and where we should allocate our resources were for people who were targeted by the war. Um, but we have several colleagues and friends, uh, Russians, who have actually escaped Russia and are in exile that went through different ways uh, when it was still, you know, went to Georgia, then to the US or Canada, et cetera. And I think it is very important to keep, um, these people are victims of Putin's regime as well. And it's important that to keep engaged with, um, with them. Uh, and the University of Michigan has a lot of Russian list and Russian scholars and Russian staff people uh, that are very dedicated to actually bringing information about the war in Ukraine and helping us also in other enterprises. Um, so I think that's a very important question, provocative, but important for us to think about. And that we very seriously uh, pondered this about our role and where we can help. And, um, and we felt also very sorry with several of our colleagues who are institutions that had to sign letters of support for, uh, for the war and for Putin and um, whose lives were also in danger for not doing so. Uh, so I think that the situation is very complex, but that we feel very happy may, that may, we have. May yes, add, please. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know that today, we also uh, had some discussions uh, with representatives of uh, NATO headquarters uh, and uh, our colleagues uh, from Brussels told us uh, also about uh, some dissidents, uh, some Russian intellectuals uh, that uh, they, they uh, still have a communication with them. Uh, in, in different countries, especially in Western Europe. And it's interesting that mostly uh, Russian intellectuals uh, say about brotherhood, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Ukrainians and Russians and so on. Uh, you know, the problem is that um, we don't have, we, we still don't have uh, public initiatives uh, from uh, Russian intellectuals. Uh, from, uh, you know, in time of full-scale Russian invasion, maybe you know that uh, Russian universities institutionally 
All of them supported Putin's regime and war in Ukraine. All of them, all of them. Uh, and we, we don't have such public initiatives from uh, Russian intellectuals uh, against uh, such support of Putin's regime, on the one hand. On the other hand, unfortunately, uh, we, we know uh, results of different sociological survey that uh, uh, Russian society still uh, supports Putin uh, totally, almost totally. Uh, that is why, you know, uh, we, we don't need, I, I think from the point of, of Ukrainians, maybe, that we don't need uh, any brotherhood, any uh, sisters or brothers, we, we just need respect to our independence. And we also need in our time, public initiatives uh, against Putin's regime and uh, for support, uh, you know, Ukrainian independence. It, it's really important. You know, uh, and but but I, I think it's a, a very sensitive a sensitive question, and uh, we discussed uh, such issues uh, in Brussels today too. Thank you. Thank you. If I may add. Yes, please. Yes, uh, I'm I'm really support ideas of uh, uh, rector, uh, president of Kiev Academy, Street and uh, I would add that it's a really sensitive situation when. We meet in some Russian colleagues, even they not support Ukraine, and uh, in many reasons. It's it's also depend of experience what we have uh, during this year and previous years. But uh, in what you say, Genevieve, it's very important that uh, Western universities can be not only place uh, for providing uh, 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 working place for us and. Uh, collaboration, uh, but it also can be places uh, for uh, mediation. And also it's like uh, you can do like role uh, like mediators, but in, it's very important. And I, I say sensitive uh, question because we also need to change our uh, understanding. Uh, I mean, Western, our Western colleagues should uh, change in our understanding uh, between uh, situation between Russian and Ukrainian scholars, because from my experience, some colleagues uh, meeting me with, to Russian scholars say, "Okay, you have Russian scholar, uh, he or she not support work in Ukraine, but he uh, or she speak Russian, so enjoy communication." <laughs> uh, it's very difficult, you know, because why why everyone. Uh, uh, believe that all Ukrainians know Russian, not not all, really not all, all so R Russian speakers, not all Ukrainians Russian speakers. So we need, we, we, we should uh, do this, build this communication, provide this uh, um, mediation, uh, very, very uh, like uh, prepared, well prepared. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm John Chorchieri from the Ford School. Uh, Ksenia, I was very interested in your comment about extending international humanitarian law to uh, cyber attacks. And uh, IHL, international humanitarian law, does provide a normative framework for thinking about certain kinds of cyber attacks, military focused attacks. And you go through is it military, uh, uh, militarily necessary? Does it exercise distinction between civilian and military targets? Is it proportionate? But we don't have a very good normative framework internationally for cyber operations directed toward toward civilian or economic targets. And we don't have a good normative framework at all for disinformation campaigns of the kind that Anna is studying. And so my question is how, how the two of you and others who are interested to respond think about how a normative uh, regime could be developed in these important areas. We all agree these are essential to the way that countries compete in the international stage now. And we really don't have a good set of norms to deal with them. One way I can think of that norms evolve is through international revulsion and shock, such as norms against slavery and genocide. But oftentimes norms also develop because two or more countries face threats from one another and adopt norms in a form of reciprocity. Good examples there might include norms against non-first use of nuclear weapons or norms about treatment of prisoners of war. 
And so it raises the provocative question, does the West need to demonstrate to Russia greater capacity to hurt Russian interests through enhanced cyber and information operations in order to develop a set of reciprocal norms about uh, in these areas? Or are there other ways that you can imagine a, a normative regime developing that would constrain Russian and other behavior? Before you answer, I just want to say John Chachari is Associate Dean of the Ford School and Director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center. And he's also the faculty mentor of Xenia. Thank you, John. Yes, that's probably that's why I'll take this question. Thank you for uh, for this uh, uh, question. And uh, actually, this is the topics that uh, I'm like right now uh, trying to get more closely and uh, trying to understand how. Uh, as I already said, that uh, as my understanding that uh, in certain uh, dis uh, distinctive amount uh, that international humanitarian law has, uh, is already applying to the cases of cyber aggression and cyber war. And uh, for example, if it will be uh, uh, there is certain types that we can envisage. Uh, certain types of the operations, sub operations that can be taken, for example, in the time of the uh, war, and uh, if they even if uh, or if they can be amounted as a use of force. And uh, we uh, certainly it will be the use uh, considered uh, how their experts right now consider it if it will be uh, certainly a use of force if they will be uh, their uh, killings of their uh, people or it will be injury to the people or it will be their uh, for example their destruction of some physical objects from the cyber operation. So this is understandable that it will might be their uh, case when it can be understood that the use of force, but of course there should be uh, other diplomatic means that will apply because uh, we already heard their uh, allegations of. Uh, uh, not already said that we are ready to use uh, of, uh, accept a separation of the use of force, but uh, we don't know if it will re really happen in the diplomacy uh, kind of uh, um, communication. Uh, but if there was not such consequences, uh, there is uh, certain uh, things that uh, should be taken in, uh, into account. It's immediacy of the effect. It's uh, if they're really, uh, we can prove their cause and their effect uh, uh, and their uh, consequences. There is uh, uh, their connection with this. If this uh, effect uh, became um, uh, not in this uh, pretty much a shorter amount of time, if we can evaluate them, because uh, sometimes it's very hard to evaluate uh, their effects or the cyber operation, because it's uh, also can be connected with their uh, uh, ch uh, changing or uh, raising of some data and how important is this data, because it's uh, what is computer data, it can be, uh, we can, uh, another question, uh, because uh, we can uh, reuse it, we can, uh, what, uh, how you will uh, evaluate this question, and also if it's uh, uh, also targeted to the military targets, uh, and uh, if it can be also attributed to the state. So of course, like international humanitarian law should be considered and uh, the question of attribution is also very important. Uh, so I, uh, if uh, we talk about uh, the questions of propaganda, how we can fight it in the international level, it's not uh, um, abandoned. So every, everything that is not uh, actually uh, a ban on the international law, it's uh, presumably permissive. If, uh, it's uh, the uh, concept of uh, presumable legality right now. Uh, but uh, talking about uh, we, ha we have certain norms in their international uh, uh, in their Ukrainian criminal law that can fight this propaganda on the legal level. We have certain uh, informational crimes that uh, uh, can uh, we can uh, uh, if uh, uh, we can open the cases uh, on the key, uh, if there is uh, public appeals to commit any uh, some illegal actions. Also, for example, it will be uh, considered as uh, a collaboration activity. For example, if uh, people uh, propaganda uh, their uh, uh, decisions of their occupying power, or if uh, they uh, uh, publicly uh, deny their uh, uh, that there is uh, their war in Ukraine uh, and uh, it's only like something civil conflict. So there is norms like this. So our criminal code is already. Uh, made some amendments to this question. So on the national level, there is such uh, uh, cases on the anti-propaganda, but of course, I agree with you that sh there should be more international agreements on this, more international effort to do this. But uh, as we see uh, right now, uh, uh, our uh, their legalists, their lawyers, they use their uh, what is available. And these norms uh, maybe come as a custom right now, but maybe they will come uh, in the further uh, uh, development as uh, some uh, rulings. Yeah, and I can briefly also comment on this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John, for your question and your comment. So um, 
Uh, yeah, just to concur with what uh, Ksenia said, and I can mention that last year I took an online course thanks to um, was offered uh, like the information was uh, spread uh, through information channels of my university, Kiev Mahila Academy, and uh, thanks to the under the, uh, the course was um, uh, provided under the auspices of USAID and the ILPG uh, pro bono firm, mm -hmm. and the course was on uh, transitional justice, and it was very interesting. Um, like material and in particular I, I like actually asked and so as of fall of 2021 last year and our uh, the course instructors were lawyers and diplomats and politicians who actually prosecuted um, um, people uh, like convicted of uh, or, or suspected of committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide in different parts of the world, and they participated in different tribunals worldwide. And so, as of uh, fall uh, 2021 last year, so there were no like such precedents yet uh, regarding uh, like cyber uh, like crime uh, cases yet. So really, like this war, like Russia-Ukraine war sets many precedents, we believe, like in many regards, and it's very, I guess, um, uh, a lot has to be done, definitely documented, and then, of course, um, like former, formalized uh, in order to, um, to be used uh, to prevent further crimes, we believe. Okay. Thank you. We have one online question from... Uh, Germany, Mark Kamenbauer, uh, who says, congratulations to the colleagues from Ukraine for keeping up their work during this uh, very uh, challenging time. And the question is addressed to Oksana uh, more specifically. So he writes, we know since the pandemic that teaching architecture online is challenging, especially because of the importance of three-dimensional objects for the curriculum. Designs of buildings or parts of buildings are substituted by three dimensional scale models, which are, which are used for counseling and presentation purposes. How to substitute these three dimensional models into two dimensional space of the individual screen when there is no palpable depth in an online teaching setting? Can Oksana share her insights on how to work with or around the circumstance in architectural pedagogy? Yes, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, and uh, um, of course, architecture uh, has uh, special difficulties in teaching online. And uh, these questions are faced uh, not only by us, by all architects uh, which are teaching all over the world uh, using online systems which started during the pandemic. So it means that um, we have to uh, use not only a con a web conferencing, uh, but also uh, to understand how to teach students uh, the creative um, design uh, um, skills. And uh, in class, in person, of course, we use three-dimensional approaches, which through the models, but at the same time, uh, in parallel, we had been using, and uh, as other architects uh, are using, the uh, soft for uh, 3D um, visualization. It doesn't substitute all. We know, uh, I mean, all to teach all the skills, but we know uh, we uh, use, of course, uh, um, three-dimensional uh, uh, soft, uh, softs for three-dimensional um of um, models but at the same time uh for instance uh, when i had been teaching in uh, last uh, semester in, in spring my bachelor students i was encouraging them in case they have the possibility and the material to experiment to study the form that they are creating to make photos of them and to show the photos on their present project presentations or uh, we had been using uh, um, a jam board that's the resource that you can collaborate on the digital um, uh, kind of digital blackboards together with a student and to make sketches and even mm -hmm. to make uh, the sketches on the 3D models from the soft, which were made by in the programs, or uh, if they had the possibility to make 
some uh, basic uh, uh, kind of working models uh, then make the picture and make the uh, the sketch in Jamboard as well. So it, it's very challenging and it's very difficult. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we have to be um, uh, kind of use innovations uh, of all possibilities uh, to, especially in this moment, teaching. Thank you. If there's no more questions, I will, yes, there is one, please. Um, Slava Ukraini. Um, it's a pleasure to see you here and thank you for being here. My name is Yulia. I'm a student of political science here at the University of Michigan. And um, my question is the following one. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, teachers and professors in Ukraine are um, on the front line right now, and they're not only giving their lives, um, but they're also teaching students from the front lines um, through the online platform. So if you have any idea, how do you support uh, these professors, these teachers um, through the, in this um, immensely difficult time, um, I would be, it would be great to hear or how are they supported um, with the resources to teach students online uh, from the front lines. Um, uh, I would like to hear, thank you. I wonder if, if yes, okay, Yuri and I was thinking that maybe President Kvit also knows mm -hmm. how universities specifically, if you allocate additional resources for the families of these, but we can start with your response, yeah. Yuri, and then uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, it's it's so interesting question. You know that um, I think it's not typical situation when uh, some teachers uh, continue, uh, you know, their classes uh, from front line. We we really had uh, such information. Um, I think it was uh, before the end of last academic year, not currently. Uh, you know that we have, uh, we as Kiev Hill Academy have some teachers uh, who are on the front line. Uh, most of them are volunteers, military volunteers, and uh, they don't have such opportunities because it's front life front line and it's so you know they they don't have you know such you know e even time for that and uh, it's it's almost impossible for them but but maybe uh, there are some uh, cases when teachers can continue their their classes i mean but my point is that uh, i think that all institutions know who among teachers are on the front line and all of them, all of us try to help them, uh, you know, uh, in different ways. But I'm afraid that uh, it couldn't be special project to, uh, to help teachers to continue their classes from the front line. You know, it's, uh, I, I think it's almost impossible, but mostly I think institutions, universities, uh, try to, to help them in different ways, not only with a continuation of classes, but for different reasons. They uh, keep, uh, you know, they keep communication with their teachers, I think. But thank you so much. It's so interesting idea. So interesting. And maybe in some cases it is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yuri, did you want to add something? Uh, ju just adding, yeah, because uh, President Kuit said, main idea that uh, what we can find in social media when some professor teaching the here students online by phone from butterfly front it's it's very motivated but in many cases it's not not real because um, i just want to provide example 
Uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, director of Rafael Lemkin Center for Genocide Studies at Kherson State University. In and in in our uh, advisory board uh, on our advisory board is Professor uh, Maxim Gon from uh, Rivne University. And from the first day of the war, he uh, right now uh, uh, on the front for, for, for two days. And uh, of course, he 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 can teach because it's it's really impossible. It's really impossible. And uh, from my opinion, uh, one of the best things what universities can provide to these people, it's a safe working place for them. Yeah. Thank you. I think we will conclude on this. And I would like to really thank our scholars um, and President Kfit for joining us today to the audience here and online. And, um, and again, to our partners, uh, our partners at the University of Michigan who contributed funds to create this fellowship uh, and to the private donors who have uh, given very generously and that made it possible for us to offer seven fellowships and to have five uh, fellows with us today. Thank you also to all your mentors. We have one here, we're very happy. And um, if you're interested about what the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia is doing, uh, on Ukraine, we have a special tab on our website that is called Ukraine. And in that, with all events that we're organizing and all other events on campus, we're putting, we're kind of collating all of that information there. Uh, but you can also learn about this other very important initiative, uh, the Reckoning Project Ukraine Testifies, which is a collective of Ukrainian journalists being trained by expert um, war reporters with a lot of experience and a team of lawyer on how to collect testimonies from victims of crimes and from witnesses. Um, and we created here at the University of Michigan courses with undergraduates in sociology that code those testimonies. We have a translation team too, and we hope to have also a legal team that will help provide legal advice on how after that uh, to take this further. So we have, uh, we're working now on how many? I think 90 testimony, 90 cases, some of which have several testimonies. This is a very important initiative and several of the fellows here are participating in this. And there's a tab on our uh, website on this. I invite you to look at what we do, um, all of our Ukraine related um, programming and I want to plug also that in April, I don't remember the exact date, we will have a panel where each will present more formally the, the, the results of their research while at the University of Michigan. And we're also planning an event to commemorate the anniversary of the full-scale invasion of Russia uh, on Ukraine. Uh, that's gonna be the week of February 20th. It's the week before we go on spring break. So it will not be on the anniversary, but we're planning something special um, uh, to commemorate this, a panel and then a vigil in the diag before students leave. So we will send out all that information, but please, if you're not on our list, please write your name and email address at the, um, at the table up front so that we can inform you on what we're doing. And thank you again for our guests, for sharing um, your expertise, your thoughts, your experiences, and for being with us in Ann Arbor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so thank much. You.